home. I'm going home. Um, I'm going home, me. Where, what and who is home? Does home have a physical address or does it exist predominantly in our minds and our hearts? Perhaps it follows us wherever we go as long as we are happy. Are we really home in our own skin when we are sad? Surely home explodes into our lives when we meet our love, our soulmate. When we were kids we spent thousands of hours in our imagination so necessarily they were considered home too. Did we move out or move on? Some of us never left. The artist believes that painting is as relevant now as ever, that beauty is eternal and that with time all great works will return to the dust. Why not look to the future whilst bearing the torch and traditions of the great masters of old? Must have been stressful. One house, nay, two. Scooped tower and totally empty. Tetris packed big van and a belly full for man, both red and grumbling. It ached to lug that load around under cloudless August sun. Tarmac began to liquefy. Sweat that had dripped was wiped feverishly and slung groundwards, adding several welcome droplets to the heat mirage on the horizon. Memories boxed and labelled and taped shut. Kitchen, picks, toys, baby, attic, towels, CDs, TV, clothes, work. To be moved from point A, old, to point B, new. Mum wails, why? She cursed the god she sometimes half believed in. Huffing, puffing, then clutching. Bricks shook in their boots. Walls were jolted from slumber. Oh boy, was thunder aroused. Yet I was only three foot out. Toddling, so carefree and excited to meet this new person I could make things with, break things with. That's me dad, that, and me grandma and all. Dad's looming over like a totem of strength, a great hulking colossus making her up softly and tender. I imagine that's how he looks when he's in the depths of the zone. A day, a night, a weekend, scrunched up and tossed as he's hunched and lost in carefully orchestrated scrawled scripts. Wild and shimmering and gothic. Of course, in her maternal eyes, he's still barely old enough to tie his own shoes. She's still the boss, oh yes, that's true. Queen Mew. She'll be 92 next time, don't you know? Twenty-two eyes, eleven lives and ten souls. One of them had sold theirs to the devil on a foggy Thursday morning right in the middle of January's blue, dank mood. It was a desperate time. Extreme measures were needed and they had not heeded the warnings of their family. They had just gone out, sold their soul like it were a pair of old sneaks one size too big. Couldn't say who it was though. Oh, it, it wouldn't be at all appropriate, you know. That would be telling and, and everyone knows what happens to tellers. Horizontal man. I was barely big enough to get a peep. Stretching up high on taut tip toes to get a nosy. To know who he was and what was going on. Everyone was scared. Tears gathering in their eyes and rolling down their cheeks. I was cocooned between my brother and sister. Sandwiched in a white bread tuna butty. Hold the tuna please, love. As if we've not got enough to moider about today without the smell of that fish permeating room. What are you fucking looking at? Yeah, that's it. Carry on. You keep moving. Eileen's a bloody sin, don't you know? Always bloody writing. Jotting things down. Or up. Everywhere and anywhere, really. Often cutting our conversations abruptly to say something like, Hold up, hold up. I've just got to write that down, or... Whoa, what a great metaphor for life. It annoyed me, the flow of a decent conversation being severed like that. I just wanted to talk, express myself, 
not be observed like a scientific specimen waiting to make a great tale. She was adamant she'd always been like that and probably always would. And if I wanted to enjoy her company, I'd just have to get used to it. I wish she'd at least invite me into her fairy tale land of shimmering folk and simile. She lived up there, in her head, I mean. And who the hell could blame her? There wasn't much worth living for out here as far as she or I could tell. But nay, she kept it all to herself. I always felt like the padlock in her diary was mainly an aesthetic touch to, you know, leave on the table ominously when she went to pee at Starbucks. A statement of sorts. Attention, there is an artist in your midst. Credit where it's due, though, it looked like a pretty solid number, so perhaps she would prefer it to be burned to oblivion or torn to shreds than read by another. She'd been stood up. The chips were shite and all. Again left drifting in her mind's choppy waters, the flat surface of her half-sucked coat became a large brown sea that she could bob atop of, away from all the stress and bother of her tedious daily life. Work tomorrow. She would sure it'd come in, slivering between the aisles eel-like, muttering something about homework and school and his parents. How I was just so sorry and how he'd make it up to her. She was sure he was sorry, but it didn't change the fact that he needed to grow a pair. Or maybe she should just grow one instead. Go round his that night and show his parents what a lovely young woman she was. No, she couldn't see much point in that. It'd be late anyway. Not worth the hassle, you know. She had to be up early in the morning. The sky was leaking its last few crimson drips while several bruised clouds queued, looming on the horizon line. Birds began to tussle and she decided to call it quits. It was easy to lose track of time in here. A couple of small windows towards the front of the bar, but what with them neon signs there blaring away all day, all night, it was difficult to discern when sun went down or even when it reappeared the following morning. The clients always badgered him on quiet nights, the nights where he'd just have closed up if it had been empty. Droning on into the acidic depths at City, with each subsequent drink lulling their grunts into something queerer still. It had never been empty though, not in all the 22 years he'd had the place. The world out there beyond the green neon operated like a pristine machine. As one soul departed, sucked out tumbling and sourly steeped in booze, the concrete conveyor chucked another one through his little front door and he himself had to imitate his same interested routine. His same interested routine. His same interested routine. The world had howled when the government had outlawed sneezing. That was a step surely too surreal even for them. Yet here she was, 16 feet under in her small oblong dwelling, shovel dug by husband and son a couple of years earlier, getting her sneezes in before returning to the surface. Stays in, they'd said. You've got to be pleading, joking. She checked the seven day and it was 80, 90, 70, 80, 90, 60, 70 percent chance of rain, so perhaps she'd not bother going up for a while. They had everything they needed down here. To be comfortable, even. It weren't just merely surviving. TV and all trimmings. Somehow her husband had got it to work, but that was his end of the deal, all techie stuff, so she kept well out of it. The weather was hers. She'd cross-reference every weather forecast she could find online in an attempt to keep on top of what was really going on up there. The few dusty shrubs that lined the entrance to their hole had evidently given up years ago. Their near-fossilised spidery remains petrified as terrified actors in the film still. Whether a profound knowledge of the weather was in fact really useful or not remains unknown, but it provided her with something constant in her otherwise chaotic life. A crutch of sorts to keep her ticking over when she felt the urge creeping in. Keep that bloody table clean, will you? I'm sick of telling you. Crumbs and God knows what else every time I come home from work. And you know what they're like. If it's not clean, we'll have to pay again. The bastards. Can't pay again. You know we're living to work at the moment and it just ain't on. And I am sick and tight. He was elsewhere. On his phone. Or rather his phone was on him. It had him. Squeezing tight, vice-like, and supplying a golden syrupy trickling stream of clipped videos, none of which he really truly needed. It was a bit like back in the old days, when horses were still around and their owners would make them wear those things on their eyes to keep them focused on the roads. Like tunnel vision or something. It is a bit weird when you think about it. 
We're so smart we created something that has grown to us slowly and slave us. And so he paid little attention to the lady on the tannoy in the corner of his queue. The chosen concierge of the building was at her wit's end with being fined left, right and centre by the inaction of her unwilling allies. She'd been clearly keen on pay rise, but when it was this hard to keep some of the tenants on a tight leash she often wished she'd not bothered. At least before she wasn't responsible for anyone else. Have a perch, pull up a chair and grab a good book as you are cordially invited to the deepest, darkest, lightest, brightest recesses of my simultaneously wild and timid mind. All the stuff that happens behind the scenes when the curtains are drawn and nobody's watching. I do love a good sketchbook, me. They're part diary, part telephone doodle, part plan for something bigger, often with several threads haphazardly crossing up, over and through each other. There are a lot of mistakes in sketchbooks, or happy accidents as our bomb Ross would have said. But at least mine, anyway. That's the point, in it. The exhibition out there is highly refined, meticulously contemplated and measured. It's considered for a long, long time. With the useless kinds of mmms and ahs that a degree in fine art will definitely equip you with. In here, it's about something rawer and, well, it's an attempt at catalog alt random shite that comes to mind from day to day. Seeing where it takes me, where I can lead it, Stuff springs from the abyss, a leg or an arm perhaps, and before I know it there's a man twisting his way across the pages. Those familiar with artists such as Lucy and Freud, John Singer Sargent and Rembrandt will notice several copies of their paintings present in this room. We often only look at paintings in short bursts of several seconds or minutes, but when attempting to recreate a masterpiece you are faced with a puzzle and realise you have lots of time on your hands. You become accustomed to the artist's handwriting, if you will, their style. And you learn so much from trying to figure out how the hell they did it in the first place.